Right, so um, finally getting started, I just wanted to say my thanks uh, to Meg Foster for agreeing to chair and delighted that you'll be joining us in the UK in, uh, as soon as you're able to. It would be great to have you nearby. And thank you also to Rachel Barrett from the University of Liverpool for organising all the behind the scenes stuff. Um, and finally, to the Economic and Social Research Council for their funding, which allowed me to uh, work on this project. Uh, which I'll be presenting about today. If you are of the social media uh, ilk, you are very welcome to follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle's there. And as Meg said, there will be, I will be um, pointing to my website that has some um, more information that you can follow up and resources. So do um, stick around for that. Since this is an online presentation, um, but uh, I can't assume that everyone's been, been to Cockatoo Island, so I'm going to try and uh, describe and evoke a very evocative place. Um, Wariyama or Cockatoo Island, and apologies for any mispronunciations, my English accent is strong um, and uh, I spend a lot of time reading these things, uh, is the largest island in Sydney Harbour. It is uh, located where the Parramatta River meets the Tasman Sea to the north of the harbour. Um, it is Wongal country, possibly used as a fishing spot and even to build canoes from the uh, gum trees that covered the island. That's also what attracted the birds that give it its European name. And we can see that the process of becoming a prison island and indeed um, as part of colonisation, um, it was completely transformed and uh, deforested. So this uh, earlier picture in 1819 at the top shows a very different island to the one at the bottom, which is very much defined by the sandstone buildings and the deforested sandstone foundations. A much harsher place and a place designed to be able to see the convicts and uh, secure them. And indeed, uh, deforesting was one of the convicts' first jobs. After that, they began digging silos at Governor Gipps's request. It was established as a prison island in 1839. At first they built silos which was both a dangerous and a dark job and of course transformed formed the island's geological foundations even further but really when they started building a dry dock in 1847 is really when the island began to resemble what we see um, today the convicts completely transformed it um, explosives were used to blast the cliffs uh, the strikes of many thousands of um, convicts pickaxes built a stupendous chasm that effectively became the dry dock right down into the sandstone and shale foundation of the island, an arduous task. And so um, what we see today, as I said, is a product of a huge amount of hard labour, hard work, and also a, a completely radically altered environment. The final thing that's important um, in terms of describing the island is the fact that it's so visible from the city, that it's very much an extension of the urban geography and that Sydney's um, suburbs of Birchgrave, Woolwich, Greenwich and Dremoyne actually sort of um, wrap around three sides of the shore around the island and that the convicts would have very much been visible to the people living there. And in fact, when the first uh, convict population arrived in 1839, a local newspaper said you know the greatest punishment will be being in view of civilization but not being able to participate in it um which is um which i think would have been um true actually a very true kind of emotional experience anyway um so what i'm trying to achieve in this presentation then is to unravel some of the myths that persist about Cockatoo Island and are very much rooted in contemporary colonial perceptions and to think about how they relate to island geography. So it's really connecting place and people because both are extremely important. Uh, colonial stereotypes persisted in Australia or, um, as this idea that they were basically sites of total control of complete exile and the corresponding myth to that was that the prisoners who were sent there were the very worst, the most recidivist, the most violent and this is um, sort of a perception that data is persistently disproved. Uh, Tim Causer's work on Norfolk Island and also the data disproves about Cockatoo Island as well. In fact, what I want to do in this presentation is um, envision Cockatoo Island as a connected space and to think about those connections in terms of the convicts' journeys to this site, something that is often um, overlooked. 
to think about how it connects to other penal colonies through the journey of prisoners, how it connects to the bush or the frontier, and also how it connects globally to different places overseas. And by focusing on these connections, rather than um, simply on the convict era, I hope to create a more diverse history, because in part through its UNESCO World Heritage listing, Cockatoo Island is thought primarily in terms of its association with, the, with convicts and the convict era, but it was established in 1839, just one year before convict transportation to New South Wales ceased. Of course, many of the people who ended up there were ticket of leave holders, former convicts, exiles even from Port Phillip. But as we progress into the, second, into the 1850s and the 1860s, we increasingly see colonial prisoners, pre-born um, Australians and also migrants who are there. So in that way, what I want to do really is not th um, sort of think about it as a more diverse prison population. So this quote from um, Empire newspaper, uh, in June 1861 describes this Cockatoo Island, the confines comprising the scum and dregs of colonial society. Well, rather than the dregs, what I want to suggest is that the inmate population really represents the diversity of colonial society at the time. And of course, I had to select just a handful of the many lives um, that um, I've come across while researching this island, which are available in the database for you to look at. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that selection process. It was extremely difficult, but hopefully this will give you some of a flavor of the different um, kinds of people that ended up on the island. So, connections with the penal colony. So Cockatoo Island is most often um, associated with Norfolk Island and it was effectively established as a replacement for that remote Pacific outpost often dubbed uh, Hell on Earth. Um, effectively, with the knowledge that transportation was soon going to be ending, the colonial office and the governor of New South Wales, George Gipps, needed to find uh, a new place to send their um, convicts who'd misconducted themselves or uh, re-offended in the colony, and it had to be within the colonial boundaries. And they preferred still an island for that job. So Lord John Russell suggests, um, suggests Goat Island, another Sydney Harbour island, until Gipps points out well, convicts have just finished building an arms magazine, so a place full of gunpowder might not be the best place to send uh, our worst convicts, as he perceived them. And instead, he suggests uh, nearby Cockatoo Island as the place of greater security within the colony, not actually a prison, surrounded by deep water and yet under the very eye of authority. This quote's used a lot with Cockatoo Island, but it is extremely revealing about the reasons that Gibbs um, put it forward. The first being that as an island, it's even harder to escape than a mainland site, even without the buildings of a prison, it's a place of great security. And the second being that it's under the very eye of authority, i.e. that um, being located in the midst of a colonial capital means that they can have proper surveillance and overview over the discipline that um, occurs there. And the first inmates on Cockatoo Island are transferred from Norfolk Island. They start with 60 and um, almost a thousand more follow in the next uh, few years. One such uh, convict, sorry, is uh, John Lawrence, alias Blind Larry, uh, who's born in London in 1783 to a diamond cutter and transported to New South Wales after conviction for larceny, surprise, surprise, jewellery theft at uh, Lancaster Quarter Sessions. He's a bit of a trickster, a thief, described as a singing convict and also performs in theatrical performances uh, in, New in uh, Norfolk Island. I could not have time to go into all of his colonial convictions, but they total more than 23 years and they take him all over the colony, Newcastle, Emu Plains, Port Macquarie, Moreton Bay and in 1836, Norfolk Island. Um, and Rob Wills has written this uh, memoir of him that you can see uh, pictured here. In January 1842, he's transferred with 63 others to Sydney aboard the brig, the Governor Philip. He spends two weeks in Hyde Park Barracks before being transferred to Cockatoo Island. And he serves a commuted sentence, which was standard practice. They wanted to um, get rid of the Norfolk Islanders fairly quickly, so they were all serving extremely commuted sentences. So James Lawrence was, um, uh, was, had 18 months remaining of his sentence to serve and ended up serving uh, eight and a half months in the end. But um, Captain Inez reportedly warns that he is a most unmitigated villain and a comic songster at Norfolk Island, soon to be in his old haunts in Sydney. And Captain Inez was a, 
um, water police magistrate and also a visiting magistrate at Cockatoo Island. So I think what that tells us really is how the legacies of convictism and particularly of, of sort of an association with Norfolk Island does follow these prisoners around. So it's one thing to say that the island is associated with Norfolk Island and that taints its reputation. But of course, this had a personal cost on uh, people's lives as well. And um, the next character I'm going to talk about is John Perry or Parry, somebody that um, is very familiar to one of our audience members. Suka Streak has written a brilliant book, Under the Colony's Eye, that uh, really uh, talks in detail about uh, his life. I'm going to give you the overview here, but he's a fascinating character, so do uh, seek that out if you're interested. He was born in Dublin in 1819. His father, John Charles, uh, also known as Black Charlie, um, was a soldier and uh, helped train um, his son in the arts of boxing and fencing. He went on to Liverpool to train as a pugilist and was extremely skilled. In 1847, he received um, a sentence of seven years transportation to Southampton Assizes at the Southampton Assizes for uttering forged notes. Effectively, he went to buy his wedding suit for his second wife and uh, apparently paid using um, false money. He said that he couldn't read or write and so he wouldn't have been able to recognize them as such but the jury did not have much sympathy and one can't help but wonder that as a large six foot tall black man if that might have something to do with um, their response to him who knows but nonetheless he was transported by the Eden to Port Phillip and he was one of many exiles that ended up on Cockatoo Island. Um, anyone who broke their terms of their ticket of leave would immediately be sent there. He lists his occupation as a shipwright in the register and he has many signs to attest to that. A cutlass scar on his arm, tattoos of anchors, crucifixes, a woman and S, which could be for his um, first wife, Sarah. In 1849, he becomes uh, the prize fighting champion of the Australian colony, New South Wales. And we can see this picture from a newspaper, uh, Bell's Life, that depicts that. But he's tried again colonially at Brisbane Circuit Court in 1852 for larceny and sentenced to five years. And that's what first brings him to Cockatoo Island, aged 32. And he is a firm favorite of Charles Ormsby. In part, uh, he preferred the Irish, but also uh, because he was a pugilist and he was allowed to fight in various prize fights on Cockatoo against another famous uh, pugilist, Patrick Sinclair and others for the entertainment of the guards. And so we have a very bizarre situation where um, convicts are fighting each other for entertainment um, rather than suffering the kind of punishment the uh, colonial government would purportedly prefer. And this continues on two more stints on Cockatoo Island in 1855 and 1856 to seven. At one point, this is also part of a wider practice because at one point we uh, see that um, boxing gloves have been smuggled onto the island. Right, so what about connections with the bush? Um, how does uh, the island connect to the rural frontier? So um, it was not just uh, convicts from Britain and Ireland, but indigenous prisoners who were sentenced to transportation that found themselves on Cockatoo Island. And Kristen Harmon's written a fantastic book outlining among others, 22 um, Aboriginal prisoners who ended up on Cockatoo Island out of around 60 across the whole of um, the Australian colonies. So a substantial proportion ended up here. Uh, Neville's Billy was one of the earlier convicts to end up there. In November 1840, he was tried at the Supreme Court before Chief Justice Dowling for the murder of a hut keeper called John Dillon at Oobalong in April 1840. And the court records make a point of emphasizing the distance of this place. So they say it's 440 miles from Sydney and beyond the boundaries of location. And this is a really key term because being beyond the boundaries of location um, indicates a sense of being in an unpleased area in an area where we needed to bring the law, but also a site where indigenous people might not be expected to understand um, what is expected of them under um, an invader's law effectively. The case is not very compelling. It relies very heavily on uh, witnesses, sorry, the um, witnesses listen to the dying confession of John Dillon who identifies Neville's Billy as the man that speared him. 
Um, but they didn't have any direct knowledge of Neville's Billy themselves. So much of this identification rests on what he's wearing. And on top of that, it's not um, officially, it's not immediately relayed to a justice of the peace or someone. It's many months after the fact. So there's no sense this is necessarily a true account. So based on this and um, the fact that this is an indigenous defendant, the judge Dowling deems it a one sided trial and recommends that the all white jury jury acquits. And in this time period, there is a lot of discussion about how much the law can rightfully um, can be interpreted in relationship to indigenous defendants. So in his recommendations to the jury, he says the prisoner, an uncivilized savage, though held by the courts amenable to British law, labored under the disadvantage of being tried by a tribunal to him wholly foreign and without the privilege of calling any of his own country if they could have been witnesses on his behalf. He was also ignorant of the passing of the court, he notes, and had limited English um, based purely on occasional encounters with um, hut keepers at the frontier. Nonetheless, the jury finds him guilty after just 30 minutes deliberation um, and in court, so, and he receives a death sentence. So we see here that uh, this the long speech by Dowling has little impact when what you're talking about is a unsympathetic jury, a jury that's also keen to establish law at the frontier and the kind of huge impact obviously that race had on um, the outcome. Nonetheless, the um, Governor Gipps and the judge are uh, more sympathetic and Gipps expends, extends his royal prerogative of mercy and grants um, Neville's Billy a conditional pardon to spend three years on Cockatoo Island. This was a common mechanism for um, the indigenous prisoners to end up on Cockatoo. Or Cockatoo. Unfortunately, exposure to um, European diseases and the hard labour regimes on the island meant that this was often a staying of the death sentence as opposed to um, uh, full mercy because uh, there was a very high death rate and sadly Neville's Billy arrived on the island in February but died two months later. Uh, sorry that says 1851 above it should have said 1841 but yes it's not much of a stay of execution sadly. Um, John Fahey is another um, prisoner on Cockatoo Island that uh, is um, related to the bush but also points to the sort of transnational connections that Cockatoo Island formed a part of. Uh, he was part of the Irish 27th Regiment of Foot, stationed at the Cape Colony and involved in the dispossession of the indigenous people there um, as part of the frontier wars against the Zosa. And we see a very similar setup here where a harbour island in the colonial capital is used for the removal of indigenous people um, who are resisting or supposedly breaking invaders' lords and being sent um, to be incarcerated away from the frontier. So it's definitely an imperial pattern. Anyway, John Fahey, um, perhaps, um, perhaps aware of his role in this process, a court is deserts from the armed forces and is court-martialed and transported for life in 1837. He's sent aboard the Clyde to the New South Wales, um, here he repeatedly attempts to abscond. Um, in March 1840 he succeeds to abscond in absconding from Gross's farm, he tries again in November 1841 unsuccessfully and in April 1842 he makes a real escape from the road gang where he's been punished for his previous abscondings and manages to make it into the Bunya Mountains. And here he lives for more than 10 years undiscovered with the Gubi Gubi people and learns um, a lot about their culture and is supposedly protected from being um, recaptured on many occasions thanks to their efforts. However, in 1854, Lieutenant Bly manages to ca catch up with him and they are uh, delighted to have found someone who has such a knowledge of this area that they would like to expand into, um, explore and discover the missing explorer, Ludwig Leichhardt. Purportedly, for the first few days, John Fahey he couldn't even um, speak English. He was so um, assimilated, and um, and he or he uses. It's also possible that he was using that as a tactic to refuse to give up information on um, the indigenous community that he had found a home with. Regardless, he ends up being sentenced to twelve months of hard labour um, in chains. So the chains are taken off after a much shorter period and sent to Cockatoo Island. Towards the end of his sentence, his wife, Bridget, petitions from Roscommon to say that her and her family have been left in poverty 
that her husband should be um, allowed to be released early and be given the opportunity to join the North Australian Exploration Expedition as a guide that would then also offer his family um, the money to potentially join him. And she, um, she's um, sort of supported by a number of very high profile uh, people who sign his petition, including the leader of the expedition, AC Gregory, but also Lord Fitzroy Somerset of the House Guards and Norman Merivale from Downing Street. So clearly this is something that uh, Britain and particularly the Royal Geographical Society is as interested in. Um, and it all centers on having the help of this singular convict and him not being immobilized on Cockatoo Island. But it's certainly interesting how his wife utilizes effectively um, her sort of a personal story all the way from Ireland as a, as a guise for what is really about extending colonial um, frontiers um, for very different reasons, but that it's, um, I don't know, kind of a utilization of mobility and the offering of um, freedom to a man who is um, under confinement anyway. Um, so the third thing that I wanted to explore was um, prisoners who had a connections overseas, not necessarily through the, the convict transportation system. And um, what we see on Cockatoo Island is quite a high number in the 1850s and 60s of sailors who've been, been convicted. They usually on shore leave, on, on occasions they've actually working as day labourers in the port city. Um, sometimes these offences are to do with drunkenness or petty larceny, sometimes brawls, but we also see cases of desertion and um, times when uh, they're sort of, um, sort of fights between um, the two, sorry, fights between sailors are to do with feeling that they've um, been mistreated while on board. So sort of an attempt to uh, seize justice once they're in port, or at least that's the reason they give for trying to desert. These vessels are from all over the world, so we see a number of people of colour and it gives us a slightly different perspective on the prison population there. Uh, the prisoner that I want to talk about today is William Berry, or Barry, um, spelled both ways in the registers. He's a black Catholic American from New York. He was formerly employed as a ship's cook sorry, on the J.R. Morris. And he was um, convicted at the Sydney Quarter Sessions in, on the 26th of July, 1858. The previous month, the 29th of June, he'd gone on basically a stealing spree. He'd gone from Sailor's Boarding House to Sailor's Boarding House on George Street, um, posing as a guest there and taking whatever he could find. And he also visited uh, ships docked at the Circular Quay, the Dawson, the May Judah and the Lizzie Oakford. And again, used his knowledge of uh, these sort of transient populations and the payment systems to try and get whatever he could find. So the items he took included several watches and chains, a coat, a sailor's discharge wages from his pocket where his coat hung up in the wall and even seals. Um, so he basically used his anonymity, but also I think it's worth thinking about as a black man, how it's only in that kind of environment that he would be able to pass so kind of unnoticed uh, and anonymous because of the multicultural nature of that population as he passed from sailors boarding house to vessels. He was sentenced to five years hard labor on the roads and sent to Cockatoo Island. Here he would have continued to have um, sort of some sort of access or at least be able to see people who were living his former life as at this time in the 1850s we start uh, the port starts to be used the dry dock sorry and ships would be arriving sailors would be going uh, getting off ship and we see evidence of prisoners um, trading tobacco talking to smoking with the sailors while they're supposed to be repairing the vessels or working in the workshops so we certainly would have been reminded of the life he'd lost um, and whether that would have been um, more of a punishment, it's hard to know. He ended up serving a little less than four years on the island and was released on the 22nd of May 1862 after he successfully petitioned um, the government to let him leave early. He says, your petitioner prays that being a seaman may be allowed to ship and thus place himself in exile, his long period of imprisonment, it being his first offence and his good conduct being taken into consideration. He had a few little misconducts, a bit of gambling here and there, um, but he'd been generally well behaved and there was certainly precedent for sending prisoners um, who were from different countries away on the condition that they left the British Dominion and we see a lot of sailors uh, leave in that way. Um, 
The next prisoners that I want to talk about are two Chinese prisoners. This is a photo from um, a different time period. So this is not either of those prisoners, but it's uh, gold diggers was how many um, Chinese people ended up in, Cock um, in, in New South Wales and often a route onto, into New South Wales and therefore Cockatoo Island. Uh, the two prisoners I want to talk to today are called Sin Soon, or sometimes are denoted differently, and Hin Sik. Obviously, these are gross anglicizations of these names, and my apologies. It's quite difficult sometimes to trace a, a Chinese prisoners for the reason that they are um, very impartially recorded or um, differently recorded in the registers. These prisoners have a very sad story. They were convicted at Bathurst Circuit Court in September 1854 for murdering their employer, Richard Granger, at Toulon on the Castlereagh River the previous July and were sentenced to 12 years on the roads. Um, Granger was a very abusive employer who it seems to me deliberately chose um, to employ Chinese people. He had between six and eight on his farm as, as hands. And he would do that because they were easier to exploit. He would often get drunk and kick and beat them. And on this occasion, one morning, he came into where they were sleeping and threatened them with a pistol to, quote, make them go out and work. Um, a sort of uh, scramble started between, um, well, Hintik effectively tried to restrain him and they scrambled for the gun and uh, Granger fired the gun over another man, Sin Soon's head, barely missing him. And another man, um, Hintik, who tried to restrain him, grabbed a knife and cut his throat. So we can see here how for this community, it would have been hard to access or rely on alternative forms of justice. And that it seems that they were brought to kind of a breaking point that led to this violence. Um, together, they buried his body in the sheep yard where it wasn't discovered for several months until one of their own turned um, informant, in fact. Uh, at the time, the other employee, the European employee, Henry Lee, was not um, around and they disappeared before he came home. But he admitted that for the most part, they would just respond to being abused by chatting amongst themselves and admitted that he was not able to differentiate between them. He did not even know their names, which speaks to the extent to which um, he wasn't, doesn't seem like he would have been someone to intervene in this treatment. And um, this is kind of bizarre when we think about the two prisoners that ended up on Cockatoo Island, uh, Tsin Soon and Hin Sik, were completely physically different. So the prison register describes Hin Sik as standing four inches taller than Tsin Soon. He was 32, while well, Tsin Soon was aged just 24. Sinsoon described a co was was described as copper coloured and much pocked, while Hintik was covered with marks of boils. They also had signs of having um, they have scars and other ailments. So um, Hintik had his right arm broken, and Sinsoon had um, a scarred right wrist. Whether these may have been results from hard labour or even from abuse, it, it's hard to know. But certainly the court process did not make much effort to individuate them. And yet when they discovered that one of their own had turned informant against them, they clearly felt betrayed. And there was an altercation which broke out that produced allegedly a scene of confusion not ever witnessed in the court. So we see two very different um, a community on the one hand that are not individuated within the court system, though an interpreter is made available and um, alternative means of swearing on a Bible, in this case, by cutting a cock's throat. So there's an effort to cater, but um, ultimately race very much shapes how they um, progress through the system. So in this case, three prisoners were convicted. One of them I cannot find. Um, the fourth was acquitted because he'd been mistakenly identified by the witness, Henry Lee. Um, as being involved. So how to conclude after just presenting a variety of lives is, is quite difficult. Um, what I try to do is trace prisoners' journey within the colonies, sorry, typo there. So to think about uh, relationships between the penal stations to Cockatoo Island, but also how people travel from the frontier and uh, prisoners' journeys overseas. So Britain and Ireland, which we might expect to see, but also places like the USA and China. And by looking at these local and global mobilities, I want to think about how prisoners traveled before their incarceration and after through circuits of work, whether it's military service, maritime work, indentured labor, but also the continued um, 
continuation of familial relationships through things like petitioning. And of course, carcerality as itself is a circuitry through which convicts were moved. People would trans move to different gangs for punishment and then back to Cockatoo Island, but also trying to evade um, carcerality by absconding is another form of mobility um, that often that uh, sort of interspersed these periods of incarceration. Again, I want to um, suggest through this paper that while, of course, um, a number of prisoners on Cockatoo Island had strong relationships to the convict system as ticket of leave holders who broke the terms of their freedom, ex-convicts who'd re-offended or exiles sent to Port Phillip, um, they were serving colonial sentences and that was how they were um, recorded in the registers and the colonial aspect of their um, time is sometimes forgotten through a focus on their uh, as, as convicts. And in the 1850s and 60s, we see a large influx of free prisoners, as I mentioned, people who were uh, migrants or had been born in Australia, um, whether indigenous or European descended. It is clear as well from this um, paper that research shaped people's roots through the criminal justice systems quite profoundly, and that when we present their lives, they are often more fragmentary than for the convicts. And it is deliberate in this case, I recognize I haven't presented entire lives, but that's also because if we do that, that always um, means that convicts who were transported, who were white, and especially if they committed more crimes, always have the fullest life. And I don't only want to present those stories. So by presenting, to present a diversity of stories, we inevitably end up with more fragmented life, particularly for people of color who we see in the archive. A little over time, but I just wanted to point you to a resource where you can find many more of the um, store histories of your own uh, people who you're researching possibly, but also many others that I had to leave off the list. Um, as Meg mentioned, this is a database that I've created on my website, cockatooconvicts.wordpress.com, of more than two and a half thousand prisoners who ended up on the island. You can download it as an Excel file. It includes the information that's listed here. Um, and it's not complete in all places and it is something I'm looking to expand. Um, so this is what it's based on. I won't go through it all, but it took a long time to manually input. So this kind of record from the State Archives of New South Wales from the registers ended up something like this. So much easier to search and research. Um, I've also got a blog series which features some of the lives I've mentioned here today and others. But I am aware, that, as I said, this is a resource that is continuing to be developed and I'd very much like to hear from you whether it's about people you're researching that are or aren't in the database because as I said it's only for the period 1847 to 69 it's not complete there is the potential for record linkage um, because it reflects what was and wasn't recorded at the moment in the registers and how they survived so if you have any um, comments or suggestions for how to extend it or any ancestor. I'm happy to look through my other notes and see if I have any extra information that you might have missed or indeed you might have some information that I'm missing. So do get in contact, my email's above and there's a contact page on the website as well. And with that, I will stop talking and let you ask some questions. So thank you.